Well, it's been a quiet week in Lake Wobegon, my hometown, out on the edge of the prairie. Thank goodness at least we got a little snow here this last week, so at least it's starting to look like winter. Not that it really is winter. It's not winter at all. I mean, you know, not winter by, by our standards. Um, we who remember back when winter was winter. Uh, mild, mild winter this, this year. The men of the Lutheran Church have been growing beards, starting to grow beards for the Passion Play around Easter. Minnesota Lutherans getting ready to fulfill their roles as Middle Eastern Jews. <laughs> it's lucky the audience is limited to family. <laughs> you wonder if Jews wouldn't like some chance to dress up as Minnesota Lutherans. I don't know. <laughs> but then, of course, it wouldn't be about passion, would it? No, it wouldn't. It would. It would be about, uh, it would be a placid play or something. It'd be a bunch of guys standing around saying, well, they say it's supposed to get colder. <laughs> I don't know. I can't wait for it, too. We were, we were brought up to survive the cold, and, and now there's nothing to survive. What's the meaning of life? <laughs> of course, it's all different for you here in Iowa, your way to the south here is down, <laughs> down the temperate zone here, a whole different growing zone. You can, you can raise hibiscus here in Iowa, not saying you do, but you could. Uh, magnolias they have here in Iowa, southern Iowa, they have, they have palm trees, I'm sure. <laughs> People who settled Minnesota were aiming toward Iowa. They were going due west out of Chicago, and then they veered off to the right. They were pulled northward by this strange longing, this strange nostalgia for the homeland, for Norway, wanting to find a place that was like Norway, that had four-foot icicles hanging down and, and pine forests and snowdrifts up to your hips and rocky soil. And they found it up in <laughs> middle of Minnesota, forgetting that the reason they had left Norway was that the winters were so hard and the soil was so poor. But, but there we are, and we're bred for cold. It's, it's what we're meant to have. And to get this false spring, these February days in the 50s, is very damaging to our systems, very confusing. That's why I have this cold. I got this from warmth. I didn't get this from cold. <laughs> We're like those dogs, those big Newfoundland dogs who are bred to leap into the sea and rescue people. But you bring up Newfoundland puppies out in the prairie a thousand miles away from the ocean, and these dogs live in a permanent state of confusion, <laughs> wandering around looking for the meaning of life. They know there is one, but it's not around here. <laughs> That's the same as for us Minnesotans. The Markland's dog, Max, has uh, found his meaning of life, uh, not that it's anything to write home about, and uh, the dog has been very happy about the thaw that melted the snow. It made him, made him a lot easier for him to roam around in the woods and, and find decomposed carcasses of, of small animals and bring them home and, and uh, stash them by the, ba by the back steps. This is a, a dog of no discernible breed and no discernible intelligence who, uh, <laughs> who loves to, uh, to eat disgusting things and, and then come and put his head in your lap. <laughs> the dog has no friends whatsoever. People are trying not even to be his acquaintance. He's a dog who doesn't have the sense to get out of the way of cars. He, 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 
That's why he walks with a limp. This big black dog walks with a bad limp as a result of, the, of a collision with a bread truck. And he didn't learn anything from it. Didn't learn to look both ways after that, I guess. He just figured it was one of those crazy things. <laughs> he is the grandson of the dog that Mr. Markland, DJ, had when he was in high school and the dog who was the reason for DJ leaving Lake Wobegon and, well, as it turned out, coming to Iowa. He, um, all this whole line of, of mutts in the Markland family, they, they all had uh, similar predilections and uh, liked to go out in search of, you know, portions of squirrel and, and, and badger and... Uh, you know, little bits of deer and bring them home and chew on them. And this dog, back when DJ was a teenager, this dog back in the mid-70s, fell into a slot bucket and he got stuck in it and he passed out. And DJ's mother called for the boy to come and rescue him and the boy did and she said, give him mouth to mouth and DJ did. He gave him mouth-to-snout respiration, and the dog recovered, but DJ never did. <laughs> Somehow the taste of decomposed rabbit and, and owl feathers and, and chicken feet, it, he, he was never able to get rid of it, even after he downed a lot of mouthwash. He lost his appetite. He lived for almost a month on tapioca pudding and orange juice. And in a fast, he suddenly got clarity about his own life and what he wanted to do. And he decided that he wanted to be a writer. He was 19 years old. And he had just read Catcher in the Rye. And he wanted to become a writer. And he knew he had to go someplace else to do it. He couldn't do it in front of these people. These are not encouraging people. These are winter people. So he decided to move away and go to the Iowa Writers Workshop, which he'd heard about from an English teacher, the only person in town to whom he could confess his dream, which was to write a novel about a boy who runs away from a prep school and spends Christmas vacation in Manhattan. But <laughs> unfortunately, the teacher gave him the wrong directions <laughs> and told him to come to Ames, not to Iowa City. <laughs> so he came. He came to Ames. He was glad to get out of town because when you have given mouth-to-snout resuscitation to a dog that eats off decomposed squirrel in a town like Lake Wobegon, you will never, ever hear the end of it. This will follow you around tied to your tail for the rest of your life. Years later, you'll walk into the Chatterbox Cafe and sit down have a coffee, and they'll be quiet. And then Carl will say, well, DJ, didn't know I'd see you today. I was thinking about you earlier. I saw a badger by the roadside. <laughs> Crows had gotten most of him, but uh, there was still some meat left there. If I had known I was going to run into him, I would have brought him in. <laughs> so he came to Ames. Get away from all that. All these people who can only remember the worst and most embarrassing things that have ever happened to him. He came down to Ames and he rented a room and he put down a damage deposit and he got a postal box before he came over 
to the university to enroll in the Iowa Writers' Workshop. <laughs> and there found out that it, it wasn't here. There was none here. And being a stubborn person, he pretended as if he didn't care and that he really had meant to come to Iowa State all along and major in geography. <laughs> Which he did. Which he did, and he had a wonderful time here in Ames. That dog saved him from a wasted life <laughs> as a writer because he didn't have any discernible talent, as it turned out. But he did have a lot of persistence and a sort of a can-do attitude. And the combination of lack of talent and persistence is a bad combination. <laughs> you spend 20 years writing things that nobody with any sense wants to read except other writers who also expect you to read theirs. So here he was in Ames. And he loved being here. He worked hard. He surprised himself. Met a lot of interesting people. He made friends. And he made his mistakes. And not in front of his relatives and neighbors. In front of people who could forgive and forget because they were there at the same time and did the same thing. One of his mistakes he made in a little town not too far to the east of here, a little town called Normandy, Iowa. He was out driving and he was looking for the town of Eldon to look at the house that Grant Wood used in his painting, American Gothic. And there was a thunderstorm and it turned dark and he got lost on the back roads, and he drove for an hour. And just as the thunderstorm ended, he drove into this little town. And it was so luminous right after the storm. It was glittering and brilliant and washed clean. He pulled up on the main street, which is about a block, buildings on one side. And he sat on a bench in a strip of grass on the other side of the street, between the street and the railroad tracks. And he looked at the storefronts and a locker plant and a tavern and a barber shop. And then out of a door beside the barber shop came a young woman dressed in white hair the color of light toast with a French braid in back walking barefoot across the street. She said, do you mind if I sit on the bench? He said, no. She said, I like to sit here every evening and watch the sun go down behind the cottonwood trees. What happened between them that night and the next morning, he felt was a terrible mistake. He felt this remorse in the morning. Even though she kissed him goodbye, standing naked at the top of the stairs and said, call me. Lake Wobegon men don't need women to make us feel ashamed. We do this very well on our own. <laughs> he had not been brought up for this sort of thing. And as he drove back to Ames, he balled up the piece of paper with her name and number on it. And he threw it out the window into the cornfield. Came back to Ames and could never forget her ever. It was such a memory. It's funny how months and years go by and you can't remember 
much of anything. It's like you drove through in the dark. And then one night, and you remember the pattern of the wallpaper on the way up the stairs and the white porcelain doorknob and the bare polished wood of the floor of this large room on the second story and the blue table against the window and the white chairs and the white lace on it and the yellow flowers and the sink in the corner and the hot plate and over in the corner the bed with the yellow chenille bedspread. You remember this so clearly. Well, in the backwash of this romance, whatever it was, he took up with a young woman who was a reference librarian. And she was a fine person. She was a little bit older than he, but she'd been around and seen a lot of the world, and she was very encouraging to him. And she listened to all his stories about Lake Wobegon, and she told him he ought to write them down, and he did, and she said they were wonderful, and that maybe his true calling was to be a writer, and maybe she should quit her job and they could travel around the world and he would write. And after his first book was published, which she would edit, they would buy a house in Tuscany and they would learn Italian and they would start a vineyard and make wine. She was a wonderful person and he was so tempted to believe her and there was just one hitch, and that was her dog. <laughs> it was a little poofy white lap dog, a yippy little dog, whom he didn't particularly care for, but he was astonished to see it on her lap and then in their bed lying between them. People don't do this in Lake Wobegon. <laughs> they do not sleep with animals. They don't kiss them. They don't talk to them. Anthropomorphism has not taken deep hold in <laughs> Lake Wobegon. We still basically are farm people, even the ones who live in town. Our, far our, 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 our fathers were farmers. They didn't approve of the idea of livestock in the house. This was not part of their scheme of things. Dogs belonged outside under the porch so they could run out and bark at strangers. And cats belonged out in the barn where they were to keep down the population of mice and rats so as to protect the feed for the cows who provided the milk that fed the cats, a kind of a little cycle of life there. <laughs> Our fathers did not approve of bringing animals into the house. And when guests came from the city and brought a pet with them, our fathers winced. And when they saw the lady sit at the table, they couldn't believe it somehow, the way she was talking to this thing. Our fathers did not welcome a cat to leap up onto their lap any more than they would welcome a chicken to fly up into their arms. <laughs> It was the same thing to them. And when the lady kissed the dog on the lips, our fathers looked away in disgust, <laughs> the same as if somebody had knelt down on the floor and eaten out of the dog's dish, the same thing to our fathers. So when DJ's girlfriend, the librarian, held up her dog and said, give daddy a big kiss, Snuggums. <laughs> and the dog puckered up. <laughs> that was kind of a turning point for DJ. <laughs> and it wasn't long after that that he moved out. One more bad marriage prevented. That's a that's what I call a real rescue dog. <laughs> he 
Years of bitterness avoided, vast expense, embarrassment, and shame. And then he met this nice Jewish girl from Chicago here in Ames, Elizabeth, and he married her and took her back to Lake Wobegon. And they had two little children. And he got a job teaching at the high school. And she is the organist at the Lutheran Church. <laughs> and which needed a good one. And there they are. They're fine. They're happy. All's well that ends well. He did recently, though, go back to Normandy, Iowa. He kind of swung out of his way. He was going to Madison, Wisconsin, and he... <laughs> swung over to the west a little bit. He came down to Normandy, which had not changed much, and the strip of grass was there in the bench, and the same storefronts were there. The barber shop was still there in the tavern. Locker plant had become something else, picture frame shop, actually. And up above the barber shop was a pottery studio. He walked up the stairs. The wallpaper was the same fleur-de-lis pattern. He walked up to the top, knocked on the door. The woman let him in. Same bare wood polished floor, same sink in the corner, same window, shelves of pots on two walls, small, jagged, misshapen pots, mud colored, the work of somebody with more persistence than talent. And oddly, the corner where the bed with the yellow chenille bedspread had been was left bare, as if it were a sacred place, which, of course, he always felt it was. He went downstairs and went in the barber shop, sat down in a chair, asked for a little trim around the sides, nothing off the top, please. Asked the barber, what happened to the woman who lived upstairs 20 years ago? Barber said, well, you know, I never knew her. She paid her rent every month. Nobody in town really knew her. Hardly ever left that room. People said she was a writer. I don't know. I guess she went out west. She never left a forwarding address. So he went back home. What do you do with a permanent memory? Well, you treasure it. That's what you do. You learn this when you get to be my age. You learn that you only have so many permanent memories, and they become precious to you. But it's mainly when you're younger that you can make permanent memories. So it's one of God's little jokes. <laughs> but there it is, a woman in white with hair the color of toast who leads you upstairs to a room with a bare polished wood floor and a blue table and white chairs and yellow flowers and a bed with a yellow chenille bedspread. You need those things to keep yourself warm on winter nights if we do ever get winter nights again. That's the news from Lake Wobegon, where all the women are strong, all the men are good-looking, and all the children are above average.
Mr. Pat Donahue back there. And a tune called Night Rider.